Um, I worked in the Army. Well, I didn't work in the Army, but I was in the Army. Who worked in the Army? Let's see. I'm not letting any cats out of the bag, I don't think. Uh, and I was stationed at the Presidio in 1954, and I happened to go back a couple weeks ago, and I would duck my head into offices, you know, and I'd go like, hi, Jim, hi, Harry. And instead of Jim or Harry, there would be a giant machine there with lights on it, <laughs> lights going up and down, and cards dropping into slots, you know. And I had the weird feeling that the machine was about to say, hello, Bob. <laughs> The really weird thing is going to be when they finally design the ultimate machine in automation, which is required to fire another machine, you know? <laughs> and the one machine is ushered into the other machine's office, and the boss machine says, Sit down, machine. Your work has not been going too well, and we're going to have to let you go. This is a recorded message. <laughs> what I'm getting at is more and more jobs in the Army are being eliminated by the machine. There, there is one job that they will never eliminate in the Army through the machine, and that is the job of the foot soldier. And as long as they can't replace him, they're never going to be able to replace the griper. Uh, we, we've always had gripers. Uh, we had the griper in the Korean War, had him in uh, World War II, in World War I, in the Civil War. And it stands to reason that we must have had gripers in the Revolutionary Army. And I thought it might be kind of interesting to imagine what a griper in the Revolutionary Army uh, might have been like. And I think he might have been like this. You hear what Nutty George pulled last night? <laughs> the, the dollar across Potomac, you didn't hear about that? You know, he had us out till three in the morning looking for the damn thing. <laughs> We finally get back to the barracks about three o'clock in the morning. You know what time I finally got to sleep? Five. Yeah. There's some nut flashing a light on and off in the church tower all night. For God's sake. <laughs> oh, and th then the minute he quits, this drunk goes riding through town screaming. <laughs> Oh, then, remember we were marching the other day? And I had those shoes on that are two sizes too small for me. I've been trying to turn in the quartermaster for the last three weeks. And, you know, I kept kind of favoring this right leg all the time, you know? And, uh, who was it? Harry, Harry had the flag and uh, Al was blowing flute or something like that, I think, <laughs> Finally, you know, I get back to the barracks. I'm soaking my feet. Sergeant walks in. He says, Washington caught it. He likes the idea of the limp, and I should leave it in. <laughs> oh, we got some real winners on our side. <laughs> what, uh, what do you think of Benny? <laughs> yeah, George's friend, Benny. Yeah, Franklin, the one with the square glasses, you know? <laughs> There's a real flip, boy. <laughs> you've, uh, you've heard what he does for kicks, haven't you? <laughs> next, next time we have a thunderstorm, watch him. <laughs> oh, then, then, then the crowning touch. Remember, we're going across the Delaware in the boat. Ice, ice on either side, right? Dead of the night. Who, who do you suppose gets up and walks to the front of the boat and stands in the front of the boat? N Nutty George, sure. <laughs> and th then the guy in the other boat painting him, how about him?
I was uh, I was watching television, and it was a John Wayne War movie. I guess they're all John Wayne War movies. <laughs> Do you ever think how close we came to losing the war if he hadn't been with us? <laughs> but uh, I, I don't want to tell you the plot of the thing because I hate people to do that. But uh, we win it. So, now my problem is that. Uh, I want to start talking about airplanes right now, and there is no logical way to get out of what I was talking about and talking about airplanes. <laughs> and you should always tie things in together. So I will try this. In the war movies, they always had that one shot of the dogfight with the airplanes. Speaking of airplanes. <laughs> I recently flew out from uh, Chicago, and I, uh, I don't enjoy flying at all. Uh, I'm one of those ones, first of all, who gets on stoned, you know, <laughs> right away. <laughs> Secondly, I usually sit in the lounge, and I whimper all through the flight. <laughs> and I, I look out the window, and I turn to the guy who's sitting next to me, and I'll say, this Flying is really amazing. I said, the people, they look like ants down there. And he'll say, those are ants, you idiot. We haven't taken off yet, you know. <laughs> but anyway, there's a, there's a logical explanation for why I don't fly. I took a non-scheduled airline one time. I was in the Army, and I wanted to go to Hawaii on a three-day pass. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of money, and they were running ads at the time, uh, and one ad read, take a chance <laughs> on the Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson airline and Storm Door Company, see? <laughs> so, <laughs> it gave an address, and I went out to this address, and it was this woman's home. <laughs> and she had a little counter set up in her living room, and uh, we had to go up to the John to weigh our baggage, I remember. <laughs> Then we all got in her Volkswagen and she drove us out to the airport. <laughs> we got aboard this DC-1. <laughs> After we were out about two hours, a captain came out. He gave one of those addresses they all give. And I'll never forget it, and this is why I don't fly anymore. It came out like this. <coughs> You're the navigator, you ought to be able to figure out where the hell we are. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I'd, uh, I'd like to welcome you aboard the Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson Airline and Storm Door Company. Uh, I don't know how much you know about our airlines. We've, uh, we've only been in business uh, about a week. Uh, our airline was uh, founded on the philosophy that what the American public was really looking for was a low-cost overseas transportation. Uh, we have attempted to eliminate what we call in the airline business uh, frills and extras, like uh, maintenance and, uh, <laughs> and radar and a whole bunch of, uh, of, uh, of technical instruments up in the... Uh, <laughs> Roy, have, have you ever had one that hangs on for about four or five days? I don't, I don't mind the headaches too much, but it's that damn double vision that just... <laughs> oh, uh, incidentally, I want to apologize for uh, your having to stand all the way. <laughs> uh, if I can give you a little tip there, every uh, oh, half hour or so, you want to alternate your arms through those uh, straps above your head. Uh, you, f you folks flying tourists, you don't have any straps. <laughs> So uh, don't uh, don't bother looking for him. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to have a little drill in a few moments uh, <laughs> by our, our two stewardesses, Trixie and Bubbles. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Miss Watson and Miss Savage, and uh, they'll show you how to put your life jackets on. Uh, there really isn't that much to it, but a lot of people uh, get them on backwards, and uh, well, that way you're going to wind up with your face in the water. <laughs> 
Uh, if we should have to ditch, you'll, you'll receive plenty of warning uh, because our co-pilot becomes hysterical. <laughs> He'll, he'll start uh, running up and down the aisles, uh, yelling, uh, you know, we're going to crash or, or something like that. Uh, actually, he gets, he gets kind of panicky, and it isn't always too easy to understand him. Uh, at least it hasn't been in the past, anyway. So, if, if you see him running up and down the aisles, uh, and you can't make out what he's saying, uh, you, might, you might slip into your life jackets to <laughs> be on the safe side. Uh, I'd like to answer some questions that you may have uh, about the airline. It's the, the woman right here. Ma'am, ma if I may, I'll repeat the question so everyone uh, can hear it. it. If we should ditch, how long would the plane remain afloat? Is, is that the, was that your question, ma'am? Uh, <laughs> golly, that's, that's awful hard to say, ma'am. <laughs> uh, some of them go down like a rock. You know? <laughs> And then, I don't know, for some reason or other, others will stay up for, oh, two, three minutes. It's, uh... <laughs> Sir, if I may, I'll get your question next. I want to get the gentleman's way in the back there. <laughs> Sir, could you kind of speak up a little bit? I can't hear you over the roar of our engines. Maybe, you know, if you just, oh, wait, they've stopped now, sir. Harry, the engines went out again. <laughs> it's uh, the third button on the left, I think, here. <laughs> hold, hold it, Harry, the cabin lights are going out. Uh, uh, try the third button on the right. That's got him, that's got him. You want, you want to try the question again, sir? <laughs> sir, I'm sorry, I still can't make out what you're saying. Oh, well, sure, all right, all right, you can try it that way, it may work. First word. <laughs> so sounds like running. <laughs> sounds like racing. Track and field. Ran. Oh, it sounds like ran. Uh, man. A lot of man. A whole bunch of... Men? Oh, men! Men, it's right behind you there, sir. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I took your question ahead of this gentleman's over here. Uh, I really have to get back in the cabin now. We, uh, we have it on automatic pilot, but uh, well, the damn thing keeps kicking in and out all the time, and uh, <laughs> we never really know if it's on or not. Oh, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I came out here, I nearly forgot. Uh, have, have any of you ever, ever been to Hawaii before? This a gen gentleman right here? It's, uh, it's kind of liver-shaped, isn't it, sir? <laughs> sir, as, as we're coming in, uh, would you mind very much uh, stopping by the cabin and kind of... <laughs> Pointing it out to us, we sure appreciate it. Thank you very much. I hope you have a very pleasant trip. Thank you. Thank you. I took a ride on the bus the other day, and it convinced me once and for all that there is a school for bus drivers. <laughs> because they couldn't innately know what they do. They would have to go to school to learn some of these things. And I would like to take you out of that school. Uh, as we enter the school, there's a course going on in which they present the bus drivers with actual situations they'll encounter while driving their buses to find out how they react to it. And as we enter the course, we find uh, the instructor talking to the student bus drivers. Uh, you men have 
now completed what's known as the basic course in bus driving. In this course, you're going to be presented with actual situations you'll encounter while driving the buses. And it's primarily designed to find out whether you're just going to be, uh, well, good bus drivers or possibly one of the great all-time bus drivers. <laughs> Bus drivers like uh, the legendary Larry Strickland, uh, probably the greatest bus driver of the 1930s and possibly of all time, Neil Norlag. <laughs> I, I'd like to take one of the students, uh, Johnson, you want to get in the bus, uh, and oh, uh, Mrs. Selkirk, you want to get back to your marks back there? Uh -huh. uh, good. Here, here's the situation, Johnson. Uh, you've just pulled into a stop. You've discharged your passengers, and out of the rearview mirror, uh, you notice this old woman running for the bus. Okay. You want to you want to start running now, Mrs. Selkirk? <laughs> okay. Let's see how Johnson goes about. Uh, hold it! Hold it! Hold it, Johnson. Uh, you're you're pulling out much too fast, Johnson. <laughs> See, uh, she, she, she gave up uh, about halfway in the block, you see. <laughs> yeah, what, what you want to do is just kind of gradually ease out, you see, so uh, you're always holding out the hope they may be able to catch the bus. <laughs> oh, another thing you want to watch, a lot of these old women, they'll, they'll run at three-quarter speed, you see. Then, then they'll put on a final burst and they'll catch up with a bus, so. Uh, Graham, you want to be the bus driver? Yes, Mrs. Orkirk, you want to get back to your mark again? All right, let's try it with Graham. Same situation. All right, you want to, you want to start running again, uh, Mrs. Selkirk? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see how, how, how Graham handles this situation. All right, fine. Uh, uh, d did y'all see how he slammed the door right in her face that time? <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, that's known as your perfect pullout. Uh, oh, one other thing, uh, it wasn't part of the problem, uh, but uh, I want to compliment you on it. You blocked both lanes that time, pulling in. Uh, okay, and Mrs. Selkirk, I think we'll take uh, situation 13 this time. Yeah, you want to you get in the Chevrolet? Mm-hmm. Uh, Graham, this is a situation you'll very often encounter. You'll be driving along your route, and uh, all of a sudden this car will pull in front of you, and on the back will be caution student driver or learning to drive, uh, something like that. Okay. All right, Mrs. Elkirk, you want to pull in front of Graham and see how he, how he goes about handling this situation? All right, that, that was fine. That was uh, very good. Uh, could you all see what he did there? Uh, he gets back about 10, 15 car lengths. Uh, guess it up to around 60. <laughs> then he gets right behind her, bang, he slams on his brakes, he hits the horn at the same time. Uh, did you all see how the car went out of control there? <laughs> the, the, the minute she dove for the floorboard, it just kind of swerved into the light pole over there. Okay, uh, some of you want to extricate uh, uh, Mrs. Selkirk from the car? <laughs> Just uh, roll down the window and crawl right out, Mrs. Selkirk. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Selkirk, I think this will be the last one. You'll be the woman with the packages on this one, all right? Okay, uh, Graham, on this one, I'm going to stand behind you because uh, you can't be expected to know this. It's going to take time and a lot of practice. All right, you want to get on the bus, Mrs. Selkirk? That's all right. Fumble, fumble for your change. All right, now start heading toward the back of the bus. That's it. All right, hit your accelerator. All right, hit the brake. Hit the accelerator again. Now your brake. All right, you see how she spun all the way to the front of the bus that time? That's, that's going to take a little practice, a lot of times though. 
grab a hold of another passenger, you may hit your brake too soon. All I can tell you is don't get discouraged. Uh, within five, six months, you'll have all of them spinning right to the front of the bus. <laughs> okay, now let's all get in our individual buses and uh, start practicing. And just remember, it's accelerator, brake, accelerator, brake. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, for, for homework tonight, uh, we're going to mispronounce the names of streets. <laughs> uh, I worked as an accountant for a number of years in Chicago. Uh, and I had a kind of a strange uh, theory of accountancy. Uh, I had always felt, uh, you know, if you got within two or three bucks of it, <laughs> but <laughs> this never really caught on. <laughs> and as a consequence, I held a number of different accounting jobs, you see. And it seemed like whenever I would go with a company, uh, they would always be having a retirement party. And I found out one thing. They are all alike. Uh, different people will retire, different people make the speeches. But they all say the same tired old thing. I went to one in Chicago for a guy named Chuck Bedlow. He was an accountant and he was retiring after 50 years. And first of all, Mr. Clayton got up. He was the president, he gave a little address. Then Mr. Tipton, the vice president, gave a little address. And finally, Bruce Higgins, the head of the accounting department, got up and gave a little address. And he was Mr. Trite. He used every cliche that had ever been used at a retirement party. Uh, and he said things like this. Well, uh, uh, golly, I guess today's the day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it's really going to seem funny, though, uh, golly, walking in here Monday morning and, and not seeing, uh, not seeing uh, uh, Charlie's uh, smiling, happy face there at the desk. I, uh, I got to calling him smiling, easygoing Charlie. <laughs> and I guess most of us had some sort of nickname or other. We used to call him from time to time. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget a... Well, that, that too, yeah. Uh, I'll never forget a kind of amusing thing happened. Uh, i just gotten out of college and... Uh, now, what's the what's phrase I'm looking for here? I, I, well, a, a little wet behind the ears, I guess might be the way to put it. <laughs> and I was made department head here. And uh, many is the night that Charlie and I used to uh, sort of uh, burn the midnight oil, so to speak. So let's really hear it now for a wonderful old guy. Uh, uh, Charlie uh, Bredlow. Bedlow, Bedlow. Charlie? Well, uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, sitting here uh, listening to uh, Mr. Clayton and uh, Miss, Mr. Tipton and, of course, Bruce here. And through all of their speeches, one thought kept sort of uh, recurring in my mind. I, uh, I think I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I have never heard such dribble in all my life. <laughs> I, I don't suppose that it, it ever occurred to any of you that I had to get half stoned every morning <laughs> to make it down to this crummy job. <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd, you'd be smiling and 
easy going if you were gas all the time. <laughs> Put in your 50 years, and they give you this crummy watch. They, I try to try to make a big deal out of it. It works out to about 28 cents a year. But uh, ser seriously. If it hadn't been for the 50 bucks a week that I glommed out of petty cash. <laughs> well, I, I just, uh, I couldn't have made it on the, <laughs> on the lousy salary they pay. <laughs> oh, and then uh, someone started the rumor about um, Miss Wilson, the, uh, the cashier, and myself. <laughs> and everyone was running, if, uh, you know, when I retire, and uh, she gets back from her vacation in Florida, whether well, uh, we would get married, I suppose, and spend our declining years down there. Uh, she, she isn't coming back, by the way. <laughs> I understand that sweet old Miss Wilson is uh, into this company for about a hundred thousand bucks. <laughs> it's, it's a little deal that she's worked out. <laughs> she either calls it uh, double payrolling or ghost payrolling or some, something having to do with payrolling. I can never make heads or tails out of what she was talking about. <laughs> of course, she's uh, down in Mexico with a hundred thou. And I'm up here with this crummy watch. <laughs> so anything that I might say, I suppose would be sour grapes. <laughs> One last thing. A lot of uh, people have asked me, Charlie, what are you going to do when you finally retire? Are, are you going to get a little uh, part-time job in Florida or uh, just a lull around the beach? Or in other words, what am I going to do? I have some tapes from some office parties. <laughs> that I'm, I'm going to let go for 1,500 bucks a copy. <laughs> now let me, let me take that back a minute. Uh, the June picnic may run 17.5. <laughs> and with the money that I make off of the tapes and Ms. Wilson's under a thou, <laughs> I should uh, do pretty good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>